Hi, I'm Caroline. And I'm Adrian. And this is Scandal Sheets. Welcome to Scandal Sheets, the podcast that explores the scandals of history along with the people and places associated with it. I am your host, Caroline. And I'm Adrian. And today we are bringing you part two of our series on Tallulah Bankhead. And part two. Yeah, part two. Adrian's finally back. I'm finally back. She left me for like two weeks almost. I was gone for two weeks. But I forgave her because she went to Greece and posted lots of pictures of cats. And I always bring you things. And you bring me things. Mm -hmm. I'm actually staring at it and I haven't opened it yet. (laughs) Bag of things. Yeah. So today we are going to pick back up with Tallulah's story. And last time we left her leaving London and heading to Hollywood. But before we get there, we want to talk about where she lived while she was in London and her time in London was a very successful time. She really came in her own as a very popular stage actress. Uh, This was in the 1920s Mm -hmm. and had quite the fan following. So Tell us where she lived while she was there. Do I don't know where she. Don't lived. know where she. Lived. I know where she hung out. We know where she hung out. Okay. Or I just found this story more interesting. Than yeah. This. Well, that's totally cool. But there's mm-hmm. a solid chance she was just living in some nondescript hotel. <laughs> yeah. Well, she could have been. She's lived in two different hotels in New York, so it was <laughs> possible she lived in one in London as well. So she got to London in 1923. And like I said, I don't have information about her residence, but I do have some interesting history and backstory and design interior information about a club, which is not still in existence. However, the building still exists in the heart of Soho, of London Soho. And it's called, now it is called the Dean Street Townhouse. It occupies... Oh, really? Numbers 69, and this may be a familiar place to yeah. those well, of you who really cool hotel know about that I want to stay royal in. stuff. Yeah. So, right. So, the Dean Street townhouse occupies numbers 69 and 70 of Dean Street, a pair of Georgian residences built by carpenter John Meard in 1732 to 35. These townhouses were, well, the residences, that is, in the 18th century, were home to aristocratic families. And at one point, King Charles II's mistress, Nell Gwyn. The houses were located in what was then called Soho Fields, which gradually became a cosmopolitan center, attracting sculptors, architects, and artists. The painter William Hogarth among them. So there's a lot of great information floating around about this location, including the early history of the street itself. I'm about to read the history of Meard. So it was then called Meard Street from a website called London Remembers. And it's an excellent history resource whose goal is to document all the memorials in London, meaning plaques, monuments, statues, fountains, etc., that commemorate a person, event, or building. But there is just so much more on this website. And if you love London, have been, want to go, I would encourage you to check out London Remembers. It's very interesting. In London, in general. Yeah. It's the most amazing city on the face of the planet. <laughs> well... Caroline wants to live there. It's even more expensive than Charleston. That's yeah, about. That's, that's hard to believe, but it is. London Remembers provides the following information about Meard Street, built in 1720 to 1732. It's still one of the few surviving streets in London from the early 18th century. The street and much else in Soho was built by John Meard Jr. and his father, Meard Sr. The Georgian period which spans from 1713 to 1830, is generally regarded as the greatest period of English architecture. I actually prefer Regency, but, you know. (laughs) Most of London's Georgian houses date from the late 18th or early 19th centuries, and very little was built in London during the 1720s owing to a prolonged recession. I did not know about that. The South Sea bubble. What does that mean? It was... A lot. They speculated on a lot of 
I think businesses. Is that like India, South Seas, or that's not the same place? That's um. Let's see. Okay. The South Seas, not the South Seas Resort in Myrtle Beach. Oh no! Oh, that's disappointing. No. <laughs> <laughs> what was going on in Myrtle Beach okay. in the 1720s? The South Seas Company was a British joint stock company founded in 1711 and was a private public partnership to consolidate and reduce the cost of national debt. Okay. They d- it just didn't work? <laughs> yeah, and a lot of people were ruined by the collapse. It was oh, basically it's like a their, bubble? Yeah. It was basically their version of the Great Depression. Okay. Yeah. A lot of people killed themselves because they lost everything. Oh, my. Okay. Well, that would explain why... No building in the sense there were no, <laughs> Nobody had money to build anything. Okay. So, John Muir Jr. was apprenticed to his father in August of 1700 as John Muir, citizen and turner. I like that. His father and master admitted to his freedom admissions register of the Turner's Company. On his father's death in 1713, he inherited 20 houses plus St. Anne's Court, around 50 houses in all. Muir Jr. was one of the great carpenters of his generation at a time when his trade was the key component in the construction of the London townhouse. There is nothing quite like this group surviving in London. Muir built one group of small houses, then two groups of larger houses, now all forming Meard's Street, and finally four large townhouses, 67 to 70 Dean Street. The Meard Street houses were built on the land which originally formed the gardens of just five houses, two in Dean Street and Warder Street, plus one small house between the two. 69 Dean Street, this is the house in which the Gargoyle Club that I will discuss is located, was located. So 69 Dean Street was the largest of this group with a four bay frontage. John Muir Jr. was the master of worshipful company of carpenters in 1735 and worked with Sir Christopher Wren at St. Paul's Cathedral and with the architect John James on some of the city's greatest churches. He died in 1746. It is very cool. I didn't realize that that... Muir had that history. And while I cannot afford to stay at the Street Townhouse, no. I can afford to have afternoon tea. Yes. Which is only twenty one pounds a person. <laughs> That's actually pretty good. I know. And it's cheaper than Charleston Place. Oh well, yeah. And <laughs> it's it is funny. right now in honor of the Royal Chelsea Flower Show, they teamed <gasps> up with Bombay Sapphire. No an afternoon tea inspired by his new Uh, estate gin. That's really cool. Hell yeah. All right. So that's a little background about Meard Street and the, the, uh, the area in which the Gargoyle Club existed. Gin and tonic infused cucumber sandwiches. Yes. I'm not sure about a booze infused food item. Um, (laughs) okay. So 20th century. In 1928, socialite aristocrat David Tennant founded the Gargoyle Club on the top floors of number 69 Dean Street. It was a well-known hangout of politicians, intellectuals, artists, and entertainment royalty. Aside from Tallulah, this included people like Noel Coward and Fred Astaire. I love Noel Coward. I wish more of his plays were, were done. What I know that name. I oh, just he was a playwright. Oh, I know. What was like several um, of the best known Private Lives, which she to a little bankhead actually was in. No. Yeah. Um, I know that they hung out. Yeah. Black Spirit. Yeah. Is probably his most known Okay. Known. Okay. But he also did Easy Virtue, which was turned into a movie. Yeah. With Jessica Biel, who shockingly was very good in the role, mm. and Colin Firth, who we can always stare at him. Right. So, and it was a great, great movie. And if you haven't seen it, you need to. Okay. Have it on DVD. That ancient piece of equipment that no one seems to have anymore. Yeah. Well, I mean, I still, <laughs> until until recently, I listened to cassettes. So the space the Gargoyle Club occupied was designed by Henri Matisse, architect Edwin Lechens, and painter Augustus John. Now, just to put these people in kind of a, in the perspective of the day. So they all died within, I guess, a couple decades of each other. 
and mostly like mid-century. So there was a lot of like kind of turnover in, you know, people and ideas. And there was a new set of, I don't know, uh, of artists and of important names of the day kind of coming up. So Matisse died in 54, Lections in 44. He was a little bit earlier. And Augustus John died in 1961. So Tallulah kind of came into these circles at the peak, right? Because she came over to London in 1923. This club was opened in 28. And, you know, so those were kind of the heydays of, uh, you know, obviously the very beginning and then kind of when all these, you know, great significant personalities were still around. Is it the the bright young things? Yeah, I believe so. Yes. Yeah. They were basically a group of bohemian aristocrats and socialites who yeah they mixed with artists and through lots of parties. I mean, and I can't drink and use drugs. I can't even imagine being, you know, in London at that time or New York oh, in the seventies or LA, you know, it was just, it was pretty amazing. Or Paris and the, you know, found a sack and all that. So this was in the bright. These Paris. artists, these guys, I mean, Matisse, Lections and John were all like older gentlemen yeah. when, during and after world war two. But, but yes, that a lot of them did. So the, Pass, the sadly bright young things were in response to World War One because so many men had died yeah. and a lot of the old ways died with right. that war and so yeah, this was in response and they just partied it up until another war started. They so. did that. So the interior of the Gargoyle Club was very theatrical. There was a fountain on the dance floor, log fires in the dining room, wooden gargoyles suspended as lanterns, and it had a strong uh, Moorish influence. Matisse was made an honorary member after advising on decor. His painting, The Red Studio, hung at the bar from 1911 until 1941, and after the Tate declined to buy it, it was sold to MoMA, where it still hangs today. The other Matisse that was uh, at the club, called the Studio Quai de Saint-Michel, painted in 1916, is now in the Phillips Collection in Washington, D.C. To complement the main club room's elaborate coffered ceiling painted with gold leaf, like the Alhambra, he suggested covering the walls entirely with a mosaic of imperfectly cut glass tiles from an 18th century chateau. Matisse himself designed a stunning entrance staircase to this room in glittering steel and brass, which remained in use until the club's conversion into a studio complex in the mid-1980s. And try as I may, I, I found an interior, but mainly with just a bunch of revelers. It was a black and white photo. You could see the wall with this cut glass mirrored tile, but there wasn't, I didn't find any good images of the rest of it, which is, you know, now long gone. There was a restaurant downstairs, a ballroom upstairs, reached by a tiny lift, but which no longer exists, and, and dancing on the rooftop garden with views across Soho. The decadent and lavishly decorated club went into decline after World War II, and David Tennant sold the gargoyle in 1952, although it survived as a drinking den frequented by artists such as Francis Bacon and Freud, who allegedly drank themselves to insanity there. Of course. It enjoyed the last, a last hurrah in 1979 when the comedy store took over the club, while in the basement, Billy's, then renamed Gossips, became a hangout for a new generation of British music stars. Soho House took possession of the keys to number 69 and 70 Dean Street in 2008 and opened Dean Street Townhouse the following year. Leading up to this transition, the interiors had been completely rebuilt. So I did find an exterior that appears to be from probably the 50s or 60s with, you know, some cool signage. But it's also, it's it has like a neat sort of 90 degree sign that says the Gargoyle Club written in, I don't know if it's it's called Deco. It's somewhere between like Deco and Mid-Century, all caps writing. But it's nothing great. So I, I just wonder like what happened, sort of what the evolution of those interiors were and when all the, you know, those beautiful things that Matisse and Lechens and John did and originally like when all that kind of faded away. And now for something not so scandalous. Stay tuned for more scandal sheets after the break. And now back to the show. So that was her London. That was Tallulah's London experience and one of the places that she spent a lot of her time. She returned from London. So she was there for about seven years from 23 until 31. 
And so from 31 until 38, she called the Elysee Hotel in Manhattan. 